I want to welcome those of you in our classroom, and I thank you for your attention and participation in our class. And those of you who are watching on DVD, we're very glad that you're a part of things too. This is a course on spiritual gifts. It's offered by the Trinity Video Seminary, and we're glad you're a part of it. In the last session, I talked about how everyone is equal in the body of Christ. And it's a very important principle because often we make people with certain gifts feel like they're second-class citizens. Those who work behind the scenes sometimes don't get the recognition, the appreciation that those with upfront gifts get. And Paul talks about in his uh, text the fact that we are all part of one body and each of us has our unique role. In this session, would you please open up to 1 Corinthians 12. This is session 15 and we are going to finish 1 Corinthians 12 in this session. We've been going over it during the past few sessions and this session is about uniqueness within unity. You'll remember that there were five great principles that Paul talks about when he talks about spiritual gifts. He compares the body of Christ to the human body. And he says, with the human body, first, there's unity. And that's the overarching concept. And then within unity, there are four other principles that play an important part in maintaining and keeping that unity. One is diversity. The second one is interrelatedness. Last session we talked about equality. And in this final session on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll talk about uniqueness. Certain things are unique, one of a kind. Uh, you can find the Mona Lisa. Is there another one? The Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty. There are some things that are one of a kind. You are such a person. You're one of a kind. As we think of some examples of different things in our world that are unique, the one that people use all the time and will use here are snowflakes. Now some of you watching around the world, you may not get snow. We get snow. Lots of snow. So we're very familiar with snowflakes. And we probably already know that every snowflake is different. Not one snowflake that comes down is exactly the same. They have different shapes, they have different designs, but not one of them is the same. It shows the incredible creativity of the Creator. God is an amazing artist who is able to come up with design after design after design onto infinity and never do the same thing twice. I suppose that's why he's God. The other thing that's unique that sometimes is used is our fingerprint. And that's why very often when someone is arrested for a crime, the first thing the police do is fingerprint them. And then they compare the fingerprint with fingerprints found at the scene of the crime. Or they may compare the fingerprints with a vast database of fingerprints located at the police headquarters to see, was this person involved with another crime? Sometimes we use fingerprints for a far better reason. Often, little children are fingerprinted so that if they go missing, if they're abducted, if something bad happens, that we can identify who that person is. And then the final one I want to mention may be one that you have not heard of before, but the eyeball is unique. Each one unique, and each of yours different from everybody else's, which is why, as we've seen in so many movies, Sometimes they use a person going up to an eye lens, having a laser shine into their eyes and matching up. Is that the person? 
because you can't duplicate it. The eyeball is unique in its shape, in its design, in its perforations, in its uh, misperforations and the mistakes. You are one of a kind in so many ways. Well, each spiritual gift is unique, but each one of them is interrelated and each one of them helps to create unity in the body of Christ. As we go to the final passage, we'll be talking about unity and we'll see how Paul ties this all together. If you haven't done so already, would you please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? And we're down at the very last passage, verses 27 down to verse 30. And I'll read the entire passage, but you please read along with me silently in the classroom. And if you want to read out loud at home, fine with me, but let's read. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with the gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. In this passage, he mentions a number of gifts, but he also mentions a number of roles or offices. Please notice along with me, as we look down to uh, the section in verse 28, he says, apostles, he doesn't say apostleship. He's talking about the office or the role of apostle. And then he does the same thing with prophets, not prophecy. Teachers, not teaching. Workers of miracles rather than just miracles. And those having the gifts of healing, he doesn't mention healing by itself. And all of the rest of them uh, are gifts. But in those first few, they are special offices in the body of Christ, special roles that people fulfill within the body of Christ. Paul begins this section with a grand culminating statement, one that we have heard kind of interwoven as though it were a thread running through the different parts of the Bible. He's saying, you are one, but you are many. I love this part where he, to make his final point, makes this authoritative declarative sentence, now you are the body of Christ. Which in fact reinforces what we've said previously. All of us are the body of Christ. It's people. It's you and me. Not only that, it's everyone who has ever trusted Christ. And it's everyone who will trust Christ in the future. We are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We're one, and yet we're a part, and we should always feel that we're part of the body of Christ. It is a wonderful thing in life to be part of something greater than yourself. God has created us to have a purpose in life. When we don't have a purpose, bad things happen. In Proverbs it says, where there is no vision, the people, they begin to fall apart. They need a vision. They need a picture. Something bigger than themselves. Something they can see. I'm contributing to the greater good. In the book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren, the author, begins the book with one of the most famous first sentences of any book. It's not about you. I read that statement and I went, wow, there's power in that. We sometimes live life like it's all about us. We sometimes think that 
everybody's thinking about us. Everybody knows what we're thinking or what we're doing. We would be surprised at how little other people really think about us. You know why? They're thinking about themselves. We're basically a self-centered organism. That is the definition of sin. Sin is being focused on yourself and wanting to be your own God so that you can do what you want to. And the wonderful thing about being a Christian is that we are freed from that. We become someone who's part of a greater good. We become someone who has a purpose greater than ourselves. And we begin to live beyond ourself. And we experience fulfillment and joy that we're contributing to something that will last beyond the time that we are here on earth. And all of us want to feel that when we go, somehow something of us will remain. That we won't be forgotten. That our life will have mattered, will have made a difference. And Paul in this part says, because you're unique, you will make a difference. And I have made you to have different gifts, but also to play different roles in the body of Christ. And that's what I want to focus on here. Yet, yes, there are gifts, but those gifts have to somehow be enacted in a role. I have the gift of teaching. Somehow I have to find a forum where I can teach. I have to play that role. Whatever role you have, uh, gift you have, it needs to find a venue, a place where you can express that spiritual gift. And that's the role, the office that we're talking about here. Now, in this next part, Paul lists a whole bunch of things. And when you read it, you may think, huh, this must be listed in order of importance. Like when you look at apostles, they must like be at the top of the pyramid. And then you come down and the next one is the prophets and then the teachers and then the workers of miracles. And it goes all the way down till the people at the bottom are the ones who has the gift of tongues. This is not a list of importance in the church. We've already learned that all gifts are important. But some gifts have a greater scope of influence. I once preached a sermon to a thousand people in Angola, Africa. And I spoke on a passage and realized that I had left a false picture in the minds of the people. I wanted them to see that these Angolans who had to flee as refugees were very similar to the Israelites who had to leave their land and go off until they were eventually brought back. Only I didn't realize that the Israelites were taken away from their country because of their sin. The Angolans had done nothing wrong. Instead, they were a victim of warfare. They hadn't contributed to the exodus into other countries. I was confronted by some people who brought this up to me and I was immediately just cut down in my spirit. I realized I stood in front of a thousand people and I preached a message that was false. And all of those thousand of people heard that message and I will be held accountable for it. Which is why the Bible says, not many of you should be teachers, for you will be held to a higher standard. See, the influence that I have, the scope I have, is greater than the scope of someone who perhaps has the gift of helps. It isn't that one is more important, it's how many people does God allow you to touch and to help transform in your ministry? 
It's a different role. Not better, not worse, equal, unique. And it was very sobering for me. And I said to myself, I will never again stand before people and preach a message that is false. I will make sure that what I say is the truth. Of course, I'm human and I may still make mistakes. I went and I apologized to the pastor of that church and he said two things to me that I will never forget. This is the body of Christ working together. This was his unique gift and he gave it to me. He said, Steve, in Angola sometimes we eat fish and sometimes a part of the fish is rotten. We just cut that part out. What you preached was the rotten part of the fish. As we continue, I will make sure we just cut that out. And I thought, wow. And then he went on and he said to me, Steve, promise me that you will not give up teaching. Because frankly, at that moment, I thought, I'm never going to teach again. This is too much of a burden. I don't want to be responsible for teaching false doctrine. There are too many false teachers. I don't want to be one of them. He said, you have a gift. Don't give up. And then he went to Philippians in chapter 3 and he pulled up some verses that I had used in my sermon and he said, forget what is behind and press on towards what lies ahead. Press on. And he, he gave me the courage to be able to teach again. And I'm very grateful to him. This is the body of Christ in action. I had fallen. I felt terrible. I was going to give up. And this pastor came and basically said, it's all right. You know, we've all screwed up. We've all made mistakes. We'll just cut that part out. We'll, we'll fix it. But you don't give up. We each have a unique place. And this pastor gave me the reason to continue. So the gifts are not listed in order of importance. They're listed in terms of the scope of responsibility. How many lives are touched? I mean, let's face it, a pastor standing in front of a mega church of, as in my church's case, 30,000 people during a weekend, I'd say that's a pretty big scope of responsibility. Or take a preacher who has a program on TV where he preaches the gospel. I don't mean one of, one of those flim-flam guys who says, touch the screen and send me $50 and you'll be healed. I mean the people really preaching the gospel. Think of the millions of people they're reaching. That's a scope of responsibility. And God chooses that scope. Well, the ones at the beginning of the list, apostles, prophets, teachers, they have a big scope of responsibility. And then it goes down further and further and narrower and narrower. The territory that we've been assigned for some people is much larger than the territory for others. Not more important, just different and unique. And we should celebrate the uniqueness and not look at those people and envy them or think they're better than we are. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. As I've studied this passage and as I've looked at different commentators, most commentators agree. This isn't a list in order of importance. You'll notice Paul doesn't list all the gifts. So how could this be a list in order of importance? Instead, they believe, and I see, that each gift kind of represents a category of roles that we play in the church. And as he goes down, he talks about the contribution that each gift 
makes to the functioning of the church. And so as I kind of unpack this section, I'd like you to think, if I have the gift of this, which of these roles would be mine? Which of these categories would I fall into to help the church function effectively? First, we see apostles. What's their role? They start a church. They found a church. The others don't. This is their unique role. They start churches. And then when they get bored with it, they move on and they start another church. They are the church planters. Is that a role that you see for yourself? Is that a role that God has used in your life? Then we have the prophets and teachers. These aren't the people who found a church. They instruct the church. They give people the content of the church. Prophets have a message from God. It wells up within them and they cannot not share it with others. In other words, it's like the tea kettle boiling, boiling, boiling. Eventually the steam comes out. They cannot stop themselves from sharing the message. Teachers, they share from the Word. So that's another category. Is yours involved with instructing the church, being a part of sharing the message either directly from God that He's given to you or from the Word? Another category of gifts would be miracles and healing. And this is the role that people play. They don't found a church. They don't instruct the church. They care for the church. They are the emergency ward of the church. They're where you go to get first aid. You're hurting. You're in pain. And these people help you and help alleviate the pain. One side is the miraculous. It's where God does something that is it violates the laws of human nature. But he's God and he can do it. The others is less dramatic. The healing. The people who come and they work through problems with you. And they help you address situations where you don't think you can face it yourself. So we have some people in the category of founding a church, instructing a church, caring for a church. And then we go down to helps and administration. Well, it's very clear that those people manage the church. They make sure the church runs smoothly. They make sure that things get done. The supplies get ordered. The schedule is made. Everybody has an assignment. They are the people who make it run. There's an expression. They make sure that the trains run on time, which simply means they make sure that everything goes smoothly. Is that your role? Is your role to be someone who helps the church run smoothly, efficiently, effectively? So we have gifts of founding the church, instructing the church, helping to care for the church, and then those who make sure that they manage the church well. And then the very last one is tongues. And I believe that that one represents informing the church of very, in very special circumstances. So their role is, for some reason, God has given them a message and they unknowingly speak a language they are unfamiliar with. And it can either be a language that people know, like Spanish or German, which happens in Acts, or it could be what's called the heavenly language where only God and the angels understand it. It's not human. And it's a message that that church needs to hear at that time. So they're kind of the, uh, you know, early warning system. Ah, 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 danger, danger. And they give their message and someone interprets it. So think of your gifts. Think of how God has used you in ministry. Which of these categories do you fall? When I say these words, which words kind of, they nudge your heart. You go, oh, yeah. Is it founding a church? 
Is it instructing a church? Is it caring for the church? Is it managing the church? Or is it being the informant to the church in very special situations? Well, Paul then goes on to say, rhetorically, are all apostles, prophets, teachers, workers of miracle, healing, tongues, interpretation? He actually doesn't mean like you should answer the question out loud. He's saying rhetorically, you know the answers, no. So there's no reason to say it. Are all apostles? No. Are all teachers? No. You don't have to say it. One of my most embarrassing moments in all the time I have been a Christian occurred at my church when a very, very famous uh, Christian leader, author, speaker came and spoke to our church. And I had heard this man before. He speaks on the radio. I had read his books. And I knew his writings pretty well. And there was a story that he told about being on an airplane. And he sat and he thought he had a seat all to himself. And then a mentally challenged individual sat next to him. And he talked about how he thought, oh, great, four hours of sitting next to this person. And yet God convicted him and they began to interact and his heart became soft. Wonderful story, but I'd heard it before. So I'm sitting in the auditorium. There's 4,500 people in the auditorium. I'm sitting there with my wife and I'm, I'm not really paying attention. <laughs> and he goes, you know, there's a story about this man who was on an airplane and he was sitting all by himself. Have I told that story before? And I, for some unknown reason, shouted out, yes! <laughs> 4,500 people heard me go, yes. My wife went, <laughs> not with him. I don't know him. All the other people around me are Afterwards, people are going, why did you do that? And all I could say was, I didn't realize it was a rhetorical question. I thought I was supposed to answer. I guess the lesson there is, I probably should have been paying attention. I would have been a little more wise and not shouting out an answer that embarrassed me. To the credit of this man, he never made any comment about it. It would have been a perfect time to make a joke, and of course that would have been at my expense, and probably rightfully so, but he didn't. But I have listened to the tape, because uh, they taped him in those days, and I hear my own voice on there going, yes! So this tape goes out to the world and my voice is on it, being embarrassed. Oh well, we're all embarrassed. So then he finishes up but by saying, eagerly desire the higher gifts. Whoop! Time out. How could there be higher gifts? We've been taught all along that they're equal. None of them are better and now you're saying you want higher gifts? I don't get it. Well, there's several ways of looking at this, and there are people in each of these camps believing that this is the right interpretation. Some say, as I mentioned before, he's just saying, it would be good for you to have a gift that has greater impact, a greater scope, and enlarged territory. And that would be a good thing. And there are some who say, now, wait a minute. The Spirit indwells everyone. You know, I just don't think that uh, God comes along and gives you new gifts. I think that when you come to Christ, and at that moment, He gives you all the gifts you have. And there might be some gifts that go unused and kind of buried in the ground. And later on, because of circumstances, they become evident. And I think what he's saying is desire that those gifts start to become more evident. And then there are some people like myself who come with the best conclusion. I have no idea what it means. But I will tell you what I think it means. Neither of the above. Because remember I said there were no divisions between the chapters. 
it was all one long letter. And the next sentence, he says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And then becomes the beloved chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The great passage on love. Love is patient, love is kind. And at the very end of it, he says, and three things remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I think those are the higher gifts. I think he's saying there's something beyond spiritual gifts. There's faith, hope, and love. And if you really want a gift, seek the gift of love. Love other people. But as I said, people believe differently. Well, we've now gone through a variety of sessions that have talked about unity of the body. Then we went to diversity within unity, interrelatedness within unity. In the last session, equality within unity. And then in this session, we went to uniqueness within unity. Never forget, you are like a snowflake, one of a kind. And in the next session, we're going to start looking at the individual gifts. Yay! We're finally going to get there. We've laid the theological foundation. It's time to look at each gift. Please join us.